Okay, so chapter 15 is creating a home for the resident. And when the residents are admitted to the long-term care, some of them are there because they want to be, some of them are there because they've had an accident or an injury. So it usually is a loss or a lot of times they're not happy to be there. It's a very emotional experience that produces a lot of anxiety. It's a new place. Anytime when you move somewhere new, it's anxiety. You know, there nobody likes to move. But this is called relocation stress. So when you have a new patient, it's your responsibility to help them with their um, adaption period. It can take up to six months for them to adapt to being in a new place. So with these new admissions, you just want to make sure that you're checking on them a little bit more frequently, asking them if they need extra help, anticipating their needs. So this happens whenever anybody moves from a different environment. And if they're used to living in a home that they've lived in for 40 or 50 years and then they get placed into a nursing home, it is a stressful situation. Sometimes the residents go into depression when they come in, but sometimes they're fine. They're happy because they're around other people. They like to get involved in the activities and they engage in things. But their health can decline when they're put into a facility. And a lot of times the families need time to adjust too. And sometimes the families will constantly complain to you that mama's not doing well, or mama's not adapting well, or, you know, we just have to keep reminding them to just give her a little bit of time to get into the routine. But you help with that um, adaption period by making sure you're checking on them more frequently. So, Keeping them informed about what they're doing is part of the dignity. There is an interdisciplinary approach. So you're going to see that on your national exam. The word interdisciplinary, we already talked about, is different um, disciplines do different things. So you're part of the nursing team. There's an admission coordinator that's going to be in touch with them that talks with the family. They get assigned to a social worker that helps them with their benefits, with their finances, with any kind of... Um, extra benefits that they need or that they can that they're allowed to have through the programs like um, getting a dentist or getting a podiatrist or even coordinating when they're going to go out to see their own physicians so the families still pick them up for physician appointments or they go and they're transported by ambulance to a physician appointment but if the nurse tells you that that person has an appointment today at 11 o'clock then you need to prioritize your time to make sure that they are ready to go at 11 o'clock. Because when the transport gets there, the ambulance will come, but they do not wait on you. That person has to be clean, dry, changed, dressed, and ready to go. And you're going to have to put the wheelchair le legs back on the wheelchair because they can't transport them without the wheelchair legs on there. So there's also housekeeping that's going to come and introduce themselves. They leave a little sign in their room that tells them they're going to come by once a day and clean. Um, housekeeping does just clean things, but they will not make the beds. So nursing staff is responsible for making the beds and cleaning up bodily fluids. But housekeeping does come in and tidy up a little bit. The dietary is there. They will come by and um, go over the menus with them, ask them to pick out what they like and what they don't like. and go over that information. Maintenance will come introduce themselves, the front office staff will come up, the nurses, the CNAs, so it's it's basically everyone's responsibility to make sure that people feel welcome when they come in. The inventory sheet we already talked about is part of the residence chart, so it's a legal document and it's the CNA's responsibility to get that inventory sheet and write down on there everything that the person came in with. So you don't have to describe everything, but just put like four pairs of long pants, four pairs of shorts, um, four pairs of four short sleeve shirts, um, five long sleeve shirts. Definitely put down any adaptive equipment they come in with though. So if they have glasses, just put um, like your glasses are brown or burgundy plastic glasses, one pair burgundy plastic glasses. So that when the glasses get lost, we know what we're looking for. <laughs> Some people, they have their name engraved on the arm of their glasses now, which is pretty neat. But most of the time, we just find glasses, and usually it's a CNA who tell us, oh, that's Miss Jones's glasses, because you know what they wear, and you've seen them, and you know what they look like. Um, if they have dentures, they need to make sure you get a denture cup for them and label it with their last name on it. 
And then all of their clothes, you write in an inconspicuous spot on the label or something with a Sharpie marker their last name. So never, never label with their room number because they may move rooms. They're, even if the family is doing their laundry, we still then need to ask the family if it's all right if we label their stuff just in case it gets misplaced and then we know who it belongs to. Watch for new clothing. Sometimes when seasons change, like last week, it was hot as could be. This week it's freezing. So the families, now that it's cold, will bring in more season appropriate clothing and switch them out. And when that happens, you go back to the inventory sheet and then just write a new date on there and write what was switched out. Like if they took home the four short sleeve shirts and then they dropped off four sweaters, then you just put that on the inventory sheet. And that is a legal document in their medical record. Um, put the soiled laundry in the appropriate bag. If it, the family is doing laundry, there'll be a sign hanging up on the, in the room somewhere that says family does laundry. But you still need to wash the laundry out before you put it in the bag. So if there's urine or stool or food or nastiness on the, the um, clothes, just rinse them out some before you stick them in that plastic bag or in the hamper. Because a lot of times the families will only come once a week. And if it stays in that room, in that bag for a week, it will fester and then they have to throw all the clothes away. So just kind of be respectful of their property and their belongings and know that if it were you, you would not want to take home smelly, nasty clothes. Or then once you rinse it, it's going to be wet. Rinse it and maybe just wring it out and leave it in the bathroom to dry for a little bit and then put it in the bag. Yeah. So they all have bathrooms in their rooms. They just don't have showers in their rooms. But the, the place we go to, they have showers too. So, But it's better than it being soiled and gross. So. Um, your job is to make sure that the room is ready. A lot of places that you work, now if you're working in a hospital, you have to set the room up. You have to get the admission kits in the nursing homes as well. So make sure you have everything in the room set up for the person, an admission kit, a water pitcher. Make sure all the appropriate signs are on the door. If it's a high risk for fall person, you're going to put a little falling star. If the person's coming in with oxygen, they get a sign on their door that says oxygen in use, no smoking. But all of the, just the tidiness of the room so that it looks presentable when they come in. And make sure the bed is made, make sure that the call bell works, make sure that the bed works. It's going up and down and it's not going to be a, a bed that needs to be fixed. So, OBRA requires that the room temperature has to be between 71 and 81 degrees at all times. When we go in, you'll see that they all have their little air conditioners just like in hotel rooms. And they have the air conditioner cranked up to like 90 because they're always cold. It's going to be very, very warm when we go into the nursing home Wednesday. But technically, it needs to be between 71 and 81. Okay. You're supposed to adjust the temperature for the comfort of the patient. But when uh, the state comes in to inspect or when it's... When we just need to keep it between 71 and 81 degrees as much as possible. Now, when you're giving someone a bath, like a bed bath, and you're working and it's hot, you can't turn the air down because you're hot, because the resident is probably freezing because they're getting a bed bath. So just make sure you're doing the comfort of the resident. You have to orient the resident to their new room. It's your responsibility to show them how the call bell works. Make sure you press it. Tell them that when they press it, the light will come on, but give them the expectation that it's not instantaneous. When they press it, someone will come. They just need to wait till someone comes. Um, but don't tell them we'll come right away or someone will be right there. Sometimes it may take four or five minutes for someone to get there to answer their call light. Um, greet the residents, their families. It is your responsibility to do the vital signs. So we're gonna learn about that in a little bit. You have to take their temperature, their pulse, their respiration, their blood pressure. You also have to get a height and a weight. You can't just go by what they say their height is. We actually have to measure them on admission. Um, and then their weight obviously fluctuates. And we already talked about weight. Sometimes they get it once a week, sometimes just once a month. So, but definitely on admission, the admission weight that you get has to be accurate. So make sure you take off any excessive clothes that they have on. They can leave their shoes on, but just things that they would normally wear when we weigh them again the next time. 
So don't weigh them with a heavy jacket on and their purse on their arm. <laughs> um, you are not responsible for medical care. So if you have a critically ill person, the nurse is going to be taking care of that person. And you're going to be taking care of the new admissions, the person that you can do things for. Um, the belongings I already talked about, the hearing aids, the dentures, the glasses, all of those need to have containers with labels with their last name on them. Um, if you can put the serial number of the hearing aid on the inventory sheet, that'll be good if you can read it. Um, describe what the glasses look like, get the denture kits um, for them to put their dentures in. So, and then when you're changing their bed, remember to look for their hearing aids, look for their dentures, look for their glasses before you wrap them up in their sheets and throw them in laundry. You would not believe how many hearing aids they wash in laundry. <laughs> So people should take their hearing aids out at night before they go to sleep. Take them out, turn them off, put them in a container with their name on it. It's the same kind of container that the dentures go in, that, but the hearing aids are not submerged in water. So the hearing aids are cleaned with an alcohol pad. Make sure you don't put them in water and make sure that the person doesn't wear them in the shower. They also wrap up their dentures in paper towels and napkins and put them on their food trays when they're eating sometimes. Because sometimes their dentures don't fit and they can't chew with their dentures in. We try to encourage them to put their dentures in when they're eating, but sometimes they're not able to chew, so they take them out and they wad them up in a paper towel and stick them on their plate. So just make sure when you're taking trays away that you look at the paper towels and make sure that there's no dentures in them. Guidelines for their personal belongings, they are allowed to bring anything that they want, but we have to remind them that if their valuables get stolen, it's not our fault or not our responsibility. There's no place for us to lock up any valuables, so usually we ask the family members to take home very expensive or very sentimental things, like their wedding rings and stuff. Um, you'll see a lot of people just wear costume jewelry or plastic jewelry instead of wearing their actual real jewelry. And that's just, we tell the families that, you know, we can't guarantee that it will be safe, but if she wants to keep it, they can. Um, they're allowed to hang anything on the walls that they want to. So even if they have some religious symbols or signs, even if their roommate is opposed to it, we may have to move them to a different roommate eventually. Um, if we're moving them to a different room, they have to have a say in moving. Just like when you're evicting someone, you've got to give them a 30 day notice. So if we're moving them, we have to ask them if they want to move. And the social worker coordinates with their moving them to another room. Um, but usually the, the roommates get along with each other. We had some times where one wants a fan and the other one doesn't. And then one of them has like five blankets on her and the other one has a fan blowing on her, but they don't want to be separated. They want to stay in the same room together. So, and then we, they argued with each other, we moved one lady, and then the other one missed her, and then they managed to move them back in together. So, <laughs> it's like, but it's like living in the college dorm. You get who you get, and then you either adapt, or the next semester you get a new one. <laughs> so, open closets and drawers. Um, the residents have their own drawers. They have their own closet. If the belongings are in there, you have to ask for permission to help get them. Um, you can't just go in there and start rearranging their stuff. You can't take anything of theirs. Just make sure that they're a part of rearranging and throwing stuff away or decluttering. Um, and then if things go home with the family, make sure you take it off the inventory list. They are allowed to have food in their rooms. It's per hospital policy or per facility policy. But if they have food in their rooms, we just encourage them to make sure it's not out of date, make sure too much of it isn't open. You may want to tell them that maybe the bugs will get in there or the ants are coming, so they need to keep it closed and they need to throw away things that are expired. If they have a lost article, then we go to lost and found. The laundry has a lot, an area for lost and found that we can look at, but if they report to you that something is lost or broken, that's a grievance. So you need to put that on the grievance form. So that's a written form that we're going to turn into the charge nurse and then we're going to investigate what happened to it. We had a lady who was missing her bras and she said that she's gotten like five Victoria's Secret bras and they're all gone. 
she wore like this huge size bra and I mean most of them don't even wear bras anymore so I don't imagine anybody stealing her bras but she didn't have her name written in them so when they went to laundry laundry didn't know who they were but when we went to go find them they were all sitting in laundry so usually it's in laundry somewhere it's just the name has washed off or we can't read the name anymore but laundry has that lost and found area but it is a grievance, so make sure you write it down on a grievance form when they complain about missing an item. Okay. And if their dentures are broke or their hearing aid is broke or their glasses are broken, let the nurse know immediately. That way we can get with the family to get it fixed to get them a new one. Um, so transferring your residence, like I said, it can be anxiety as well, but the social worker is going to help with that. Housekeeping, the nursing staff, the CNAs. Sometimes they just move to a different room. We're just going to pack up all their stuff and move them to a different room. And then their families know that they're moving to a different room. When you're reading the doors, um, the top nameplate on the door is the person towards the door. And then the bottom nameplate is the person at the window if they have a semi-private room. A lot of places, though, now have private rooms. Where we're going, they have mostly private rooms and they're in there alone. Okay. Help the resident move to their new room, introduce them to their new roommate. Um, and then sometimes residents get to go home. So sometimes if they're there for just rehab or if they're there and they've gotten better, then they're going to get discharged home. It's still some anxiety about moving again, even though they're excited about going home. But you need to help them get packed up. Make sure you have the inventory sheet and make sure everything on the inventory sheet is packed in their bags. Um, you're going to take them out in a wheelchair and help them into their vehicle. So discharging them, getting them dressed and groomed and ready to travel. A lot of times the families are excited, but they're scared as well because now they're taking mama home and they hadn't had her in a while. And just make sure that that transition goes well with they get help getting her into the vehicle. So say goodbye. Bed making. So Making the bed. The reason we need to make the bed is to keep it neat, but it also needs to be wrinkle-free so that it doesn't cause skin breakdown or skin irritation. Wrinkles can cause the decubitus ulcers that we talked about. So if they're wrinkles or food or nastiness in the sheets, sometimes that wetness or moisture could cause you to get breakdown of your skin. Uh, make sure you leave a toe cleat at the foot of the bed. Everybody's been to a hotel room where you go and you try to get in the bed and the sheets are tucked so tight you can't even move your feet. <laughs> so that will cause foot drop. So you want to make sure you make it a little bit loose at the bottom so that they can move their feet freely in the bed. Um, and that's called a toe cleat. And then the bed cradle is what we're going to talk about in the rehab section where there's actually a metal bar that comes up at the foot of the bed and over that the, sh the top sheets can hang over top of this metal bar. And that way the sheets and the blankets aren't pushing down on the person's feet. Sometimes they have decubitus ulcers on their toes or on their heels. They're wearing those multi-potus boots, those big cushiony boots, and then having all the blankets on top of that too is very painful. So they put a little metal bar called a bed cradle that helps keep the sheets off of their feet. And that helps to prevent skin breakdown. So, your guidelines for bed making, make sure you're raising the bed to a comfortable working position. Make the bed on one side at a time. You'll see this in the video that's coming up. And then always raise the side rail on the unattended side when making the occupied bed. The occupied bed means the person <coughs> is in the bed. And when they're in that bed, make sure you raise the side rail on the unattended side. And that'll be a test question about that. If you're going to roll them onto that side that you're not on, the side rail needs to be up. Um, never put your linens on the floor. They want you to keep a plastic bag and put it in a chair and then put the linens directly into that plastic bag. So make sure when you're there not to drop anything on the floor. Even if you're going to pick it up later, you still can't just drop the linen on the floor. Provide the privacy from pulling the sheet from under the bath blanket. We're going to go over this when we do um, in the next chapter when we do personal care. But on the exam, it will ask you, how do you get the sheet off of them? You're still providing privacy and you're pulling the sheet from under the bath blanket so that they're always covered with a blanket while you're making their bed. 
keep the soiled linen away from your uniform, roll dirty linen away from you um, with the side that touched the resident inward. So it's usually changed at least two times a week, but now it's three times a week with um, bath with the bath schedule or when it's soiled or PRN. So don't take excessive linen into the room. It's considered soiled. If you, you even if you don't use it, you still have to put it in a soiled linen hamper and take it to soiled linen. Okay. You can't store linen in their rooms or in their closets. You can't store washcloths and towels and linen. So just take what you need in there. And then this is just an example of when you're mitering the corner. When you tuck it in the bottom and you pick it up, it looks like a tent or a triangle. And then you push it in and fold it over. <laughs> and that's what mitering the corner means. Okay. If the linen is wet or soiled, you can put gloves on to handle it. It's per facility policy. A lot of facilities want you to put on gloves when you're taking off soiled linen. And then you can take your gloves off, wash your hands, and then put on the clean linen. Sometimes you may have to wipe down the mattress. They're all like plastic mattresses. So you can wipe it down with the sandy cloths or something and then um, put new linen on there. In this video, we will discuss some of the more routine tasks that a nursing assistant will perform. Although they are routine, it is important that they be completed thoroughly and completely each time they are done. Our first skill is making the unoccupied bed. Perform your beginning procedure actions. For this procedure, you will need gloves, two large sheets, or one flat and one fitted sheet, depending on your facility's policy, a linen draw sheet, if your facility uses one, an under pad if used, a pillowcase, a laundry bag or hamper, and a blanket or bedspread if needed. <clears throat> Always carry clean linen away from your uniform. Stack the linen on a clean area near the bed in order of use with top linen on bottom. Avoid shaking clean and soiled linen, which spreads germs. Lower the head so the bed is flat. Then raise the bed to a comfortable working height. If you will be reusing the bedspread, Remove and fold it. If it is soiled, place it in the laundry bag. Apply gloves if the linen is wet or soiled. Check the bed linen for lost articles before removing it from the bed. Dentures, hearing aids, and eyeglasses commonly end up in the bed. These items are expensive and will not withstand the high temperatures of the washer and dryer. Remove the soiled linen from the bed by rolling it in a ball, soiled side facing in. Follow your facility policy for wiping the mattress. If the mattress is soiled with excretions or secretions, wipe it with disinfectant and allow it to dry before continuing. Place soiled linens in a laundry bag. Avoid contaminating environmental surfaces with your gloves. Remove your gloves and discard them according to facility policy. Wash your hands even if you did not wear gloves. If using a flat sheet, center the lengthwise middle fold of the bottom sheet in the middle of the bed. Now open the sheet. Place the end with the small hem even with the foot of the mattress. If using a fitted sheet, adjust over the corner. Tuck the top of the sheet under the head of the mattress. Miter the corner by folding it at a 45 degree angle perpendicular to the mattress. Or if using a fitted sheet, tuck the corners of the fitted sheet over the edge of the mattress. Beginning at the head of the bed, tuck in the sheet, working from head to foot. If your facility uses draw sheets, place the draw sheet across the center of the bed. Tuck the edge of the sheet under the mattress. Center the lengthwise middle fold of the top sheet in the center of the bed. Open the sheet and position it so the top edge is even with the top of the mattress. Place the blanket and bedspread on the bed. 
Miter linens at the foot of the bed. A mitered corner is made by tucking a sheet in by forming a 45 degree angle perpendicular to the mattress. Now move to the other side of the bed. Pull and straighten the bottom of the sheet. Pull the sheet tightly and tuck the bottom sheet under the mattress at the head of the bed or adjust the fitted sheet. Miter the corner of the sheet at the head of the bed or tuck in the corners of the fitted sheet. Pull the bottom sheet tightly and tuck it under the mattress. Pull the linen draw sheet tightly and tuck it under the mattress. Tuck the center of the sheet first, then the edges. Check to make sure the bed is smooth and free of wrinkles. Straighten the top sheet. Then straighten the blanket or spread. Tuck the sheet and blanket or spread under the foot of the mattress. Miter the top linens at the foot of the bed. Fold the bedspread back about 30 inches at the top edge. Fold the top sheet back about 4 inches at the top edge of the sheet. Place the pillow on the bed. Hold the center end of the pillowcase with your dominant hand. Fold it up over your arm. Grasp the pillow with this hand. Unfold the pillowcase over the pillow using the other hand. Now straighten the pillowcase. Place the pillow at the head of the bed with the open end facing away from the door. Cover the pillow with the bedspread. Remove all soiled linen from the room and discard according to facility policy. Do not place soiled linen on the floor. A plastic bag may be used for soiled linen. After discarding the soiled linen in the laundry barrel, perform your procedure completion actions. When handling clean or soiled linen, remember these general guidelines. Perform your beginning procedure actions. Wash your hands before handling clean linen. Carry clean and soiled linen away from your uniform. Bring only the necessary amount of linen to the room. Stack linen in order of use. Do not shake linen. Unfold clean linen. Roll soiled or used linen with the used side facing inward. Check the bed linen for lost articles before removing linen from the bed. Wash your hands immediately after handling soiled linen, even if it is not visibly soiled. Follow your facility policy for placement of clean and soiled linen in the residence room. Keep the lids on soiled linen hampers closed tightly. Avoid overflowing. Linen contaminated with blood or body fluids may be placed in plastic bags that are tied or secured at the top. If the outside of the bag accidentally becomes contaminated during the bagging process, the first bag should be placed in a clean outer bag. If the outside is not contaminated, double bagging is not necessary. Clean and soiled linen should never touch each other. The clean linen cart should be separated from the soiled linen hamper by at least one room's width in the hallway. Wear gloves if you are handling linen contaminated with blood, body fluids, secretions, or excretions. Wear a gown if your uniform will have substantial contact with soiled linen. After you have discarded the soiled linen, remove the personal protective equipment and wash your hands. Follow your facility policy for removal of linen hampers from the hallways when food carts are on the unit. Perform your procedure completion actions. Now we will show you how to make an <coughs> occupied bed. As with any other procedure, your beginning procedure actions should be performed first. To make an occupied bed, you will need the following. Gloves, two large sheets, or one flat and one fitted sheet, depending on your facility's policy, a linen draw sheet if your facility uses one, 
an underpad if used, a pillowcase, a laundry bag or hamper, blanket or bedspread if needed, bath blanket, and extra underpad. Stack your linen in the order of use to make your work more efficient. Place the things you will use last at the bottom of the stack. Place the linen you use first on top. Sorting clean linen in this manner helps organize your time so the procedure is finished more quickly. Carry clean linen away from your uniform to avoid cross-contamination. Place the linen on a clean area near the bed in the order of use from bottom to top. Lower the head of the bed until it is flat if the resident can tolerate this position. Raise the bed to a comfortable working height. Check with the charge nurse for directions for residents with tube feeding, using oxygen, or those with respiratory distress. Remove the bedspread and blanket. If they will be reused, fold them and place them on the chair. If linen is wet or soiled, apply gloves. Cover the top sheet with a bath blanket. Remove the sheet by sliding it out from underneath the bath blanket without exposing the resident. Dispose of the sheet according to facility policy. Raise the side rail on the opposite side of the bed. Turn the resident on the side away from you. Loosen the bottom sheet and roll the soiled bottom sheet inward and tuck it along the resident's back. Center the lengthwise middle fold of the clean bottom sheet in the middle of the bed. Open one half of the sheet lengthwise. Place the end with the small hem, even with the foot of the mattress, or fit the corner of the fitted sheet. Tuck the top of the sheet under the head of the mattress on the side where you are working. Then, miter the corner. Beginning at the head of the bed, tuck in the sheet, working from head to foot. If your facility uses draw sheets, place the draw sheet across the center of the bed. Tuck the edge under the mattress. A reusable 36 inch incontinent pad may be placed on top of the draw sheet if desired. It can also be placed in the bed in place of the draw sheet, which is the most common practice. Roll the remaining half of the sheets and tuck them under the soiled sheet. If an under pad is used, Place it on top of the draw sheet, if used, and roll it inside. Help the resident roll over the linen on the side facing you. Now, raise the side rail and go to the other side of the bed. Lower the side rail on the side where you are and loosen the soiled linens. Remember to watch for personal items in the linen. Dispose of linens according to facility policy. Do not place soiled linen on the floor. Raise the side rail if leaving the bedside. Avoid contaminating environmental surfaces with your gloves during this procedure. Remove your gloves and discard them according to facility policy. Wash your hands. Return to the bedside and lower the side rail. Pull the bottom sheet over the mattress. Tuck the bottom sheet tightly under the head of the mattress. Miter the corner of the sheet at the head or fit the corner of the fitted sheet. Pull the bottom sheet tightly and tuck it under the mattress. Pull the draw sheet tight and tuck it in. If an underpad is used, smooth and straighten it. Help the resident roll on his or her back. Place the top sheet over the bath blanket, centering the center fold. Pull the bath blanket from under the clean sheet 
without exposing the resident. Place the blanket and bedspread over the sheet. Fold the top sheet over the edge of the blanket. Oh, he got better. Tuck the top linens under the foot of the mattress, allowing room for the resident's toes. Now, miter the corner of top linens at the foot of the bed. about bed making. <laughs> it will ask you some questions on the National Exam about what's appropriate to make the bed. So make it all on one side. Don't put your linens on the floor. Um, you know, if the person is in it, you're putting up the side rail on the unattended side. That's an occupied bed. Move the person in the bed. And miter your corners, making a toe pleat, maybe using a bed cradle if you have it so that the pressure doesn't push down on the sheets. Eliminate your clutter, but don't throw anything away unless you ask them first. Okay, and then again with the doll or something, if something's dirty or something looks like it needs to be cleaned, you can't just automatically take it and clean it because it may smell like the person that they want it to smell like. It could be someone's old nasty shirt that smells like that person. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to wash it and make it clean because then it's no longer going to be sentimental for them. Um, adjust the lighting. The lighting needs to be on during the day, off at night. Even if you have an unconscious resident, they still have to have the circadian rhythm with a day and night cycle. If you're having insomnia or trouble sleeping at night, you need to make sure you turn off all the lights in your room. And same thing with kids. A lot of kids are scared of the dark. They sleep with night lights, but then they don't sleep well because the light is actually keeping their brain from going to sleep. So you need to have it completely as, as dark as possible in the rooms. Um, make sure that if you are working night shift, you've closed the doors so that the hallway lights aren't glaring in their face while they're trying to go to sleep. Set the room temperature comfortable for the resident, but between 71 and 81 degrees. Plant some flowers, make sure you're helping them water them. You'll go in and see them all wilting and dying, but just ask them if they need a little bit of help with watering them. And then make sure that um, the residents are safe. Every time you leave the room, the ending procedure is to hand them their call bell and re-instruct them again to call the call bell and wait for someone to come. So here's your call bell. Call us if you need us. People are more worried about their physical concerns than their safety concerns. So if they have to pee, that's a physical urge or need, they press the call bell, it takes 10 minutes, nobody's come, they're going to jump out of the bed and go to the bathroom by themselves. So we need to answer call lights as soon as we can. At least stick your head in and ask them what you can help them with and then let them know someone is on their way if you can't help them with what they need. But remind them about their safety. Telling them this is your call bell, press the button, and wait for someone to come every time you leave their room. Um, make sure it's placed where they can reach it. A lot of places don't want you to wrap it around the side rails because that makes the cords fray. So if the cords are exposed or showing, you need to let maintenance know. And if the call bell isn't working, you need to let maintenance know. This is an example of the cancel light that was in one of the older nursing homes that we were at. But there is a cancel light above their bed, usually in between where the curtain is, and you'll be able to come into the room and cancel the call light when you enter into the room. All right, any questions? Uh,